السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بدأت ببسم الله في القول أولا تبارك رحمن رحيما وموئلا وثنيت أن الحمد لله دائما وما ليس مبدوءا به أذم العلاء وثلثت صلى الله ربي على الرضا محمدا المهدى إلى الناس مرسلا وعطرته ثم الصحابة ثم من تلاهم على الإحسان بالخير ببلا وبعد فحبد الله فينا كتابه فجاهد به حبل العدا متحبلا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا قوا أنفسكم وأهليكم نارا وقودها الناس والحجارة صدق الله العظيم وقال عليه الصلاة والتسليم مروا أولادكم بالصلاة وهم أبناء سبع واضربوهم عليها وهم أبناء عشر وفرقوا بينهم في المضاجع صدق رسوله النبي الكريم Many of us might have had a conversation with a person who perhaps mistook our nationality. And as we're speaking with the person, he doesn't realize that we're not speaking the language that he's speaking. For instance, a person's of South, A South Asian background, and he looks like he's, per for instance, of Arab descent. So the person starts to speak to him in Arabic. But after a while, he sees the puzzled look on his face, and then the conversation changes. So that few moments, perhaps each and every one present here may have realized, may have faced once in their lifetime, it's such an awkward moment. Is it not? Definitely. The person is speaking to you in a language that is so foreign to you. Every single day we perform salah, and we converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawm din More often than not, it happens to be the case that we have no clue what we're saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is akin to that conversation that a person is speaking to me in, in a completely different and foreign language. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to one hadith, when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, He responds to you. When you say, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, He responds to you. My purpose here is not to emphasize the need to understand the translation of Surah Al-Fatiha and the basic Surah of the Qur'an. Rather, I want to talk about one particular word that comes in the opening of Surah Al-Fatiha. At the same time, it comes in the opening of the first few verses that were revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the Qur'an, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. In Surah Alaq, Allah says, Iqra' bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. The word Rabb, the word Rabb. What does it mean and what does it trace its roots back to etymologically? The word Rabb, as scholars define, comes from the word Tarbiya. Insha'u shay' halan fahalan ila had tamam. That you nurture a thing from point A to point B completely until it reaches perfection. Now, the word Tarbiya, little do we realize, we recite it every single day in our salah. The purpose of my talk today, insha'Allah, is about the importance of tarbiyah in our families. And this is something which may seem very trivial, but it has a ripple effect on the society at large. Salman al-Farsi radiallahu ta'ala an, as recorded in Sahih Muslim, was once asked by a non-Muslim that, did your prophet teach you everything? Salman al-Farsi responded in the affirmative, definitely our Prophet taught us everything. So the person, he had a follow-up question. All right, he taught you everything. Did he even teach you how to relieve yourself? How to go to the bathroom? Salman al-Farsi said, Hatta al -khara'a, Even how we should relieve ourselves, he taught us that you enter the bathroom in a particular way. You do not face the qibla. You recite a particular dua, and he carried on. Our religion, Rather, our way of life, Islam, is complete. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed Islam as a way of life. It mandates for us our religious affairs, but it also mandates for us our private affairs. How we should bring a family up. How we should nurture our family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet alayhi salam as an example, par excellence, for you and I as Muslims to see how I can raise my family. There are many etiquettes in the prophetic tradition that we can adopt in our lives, that we can adopt and teach our children. By means of an example, once the Prophet 
was sitting in a company with his Sahaba. And there was another Sahabi, his name was Nu'man ibn Bashir. Nu'man ibn Bashir, he got a gift from his father, and he went and he showed it to his mother. He told his mother that, look, this is the gift that father gave me. So his mom said that, I will not be happy, لا أرضى حتى تشهد رسول الله that until you don't go to the Prophet السلام, and you show him this gift, I will not be happy. So Norman ibn Bashir, he thought, I'll go to the Prophet, he'll be happy, look at the gift that I got from my father. He goes to the Prophet, and he brings his father along, and he says, that, look at the gift that my father gave me. The Prophet السلام, instead of getting happy, he asked him a question. He said, did you give a similar gift to all the siblings? The father said, uh, no, I didn't. He says, then take back this gift, you are being unfair to your children. The idea is so simple that we have to be fair to all of our children. Such a basic Islamic ethos perhaps is absent in our society, in our culture. That whether I have a daughter, whether I have a son, I have to be fair. Whether one of my children is more handsome, more beautiful than the other, I have to be fair. It's human nature that if one child has a better quality, that I will incline to that child. But the Prophet ﷺ, he taught us that you have to be fair to all of your children. Remember, the concept of tarbiyah is so essential in our lives that the Prophet ﷺ, he said that when a person passes away, his deeds, his book of deeds will close. He will have no more rewards except three things. And one of those, what was it? A child who will pray for you after you demise, after your demise, after you depart from this world. So we understand that when you give tarbiyah to a child, perhaps, perhaps it will be useful for him in this life, but it will also be useful for you in the hereafter. The Prophet ﷺ, it's so beautiful the way he taught children that he never let an opportunity go except that if he felt the need to educate a youngster in front of him, he would seize that opportunity. Once he was sitting with Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala an, and they were having meals. Anas radiallahu anhu, he was eating, he was a youngster, so his hands was going all over the place. He was eating from one corner, then another corner, then another corner. The Prophet alayhi salam, he gently advised him, saying, Ya Bunayya, O oh my beloved son. He didn't tell him, Kam bakht, what are you doing? How dare your hand go all over the place? No, he says, Ya Bunayya, O oh my beloved son. He addressed him very kindly. And then he says, Sammillah, take the name of Allah. Wakul biyaminik, eat with your right hand. Wakul mimma yalik, eat what is closest to you. So look, the Prophet alayhi salam, he didn't just let the child go, let him eat as he wants. Rather, he, taught, he took this opportunity to teach him. And it's so beautiful that the way the Prophet alayhi salam taught, anybody, nobody felt offended. Once a person was praying salah, and he started to talk in his salah. When the salah was done, the Prophet ﷺ didn't scold him. He never reprimanded him. He just told him very beautifully that the salah that you are praying is not suitable that you speak normal talk in it. You are conversing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so respect that conversation. He never yelled at him. He never reprimanded him. On another occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was with his nephew, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Abdullah ibn Abbas was on the conveyance behind the Prophet ﷺ, and as they were driving or riding, he thought to himself that why let the time go wasted when I can teach this youngster something. So he turns around to Abdullah ibn Abbas and he says, Ya Ghulam, He taught him something. He said that, you know what, I'm not going to waste this opportunity. He says, oh my beloved son, oh youngster, why don't you take a piece of advice? I will teach you something by virtue of which you will benefit. He said, Protect the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect you. Protect the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will find him at every turn, at every difficulty. And then he gave him a few advices. What do we learn from this? That perhaps we're going on a trip with the family, a road trip. And mashallah, everybody's quiet in the car or we're talking about normal matters. A few hours go by. Why not take that opportunity to educate them about basic Islamic etiquettes of traveling? That we enter the car, what dua should we read? Or as we're driving, how can we keep ourselves busy, busy with particular adhkar, with particular tasbihat? So that's an opportune moment that we can address our children and teach them Islamic etiquettes. 
And it's not like we're busy doing anything else. Another thing that's absolutely important for the ideal Islamic household, and this is something that has become somewhat of an epidemic, and I address myself here first as well, that we have to be very careful of what we eat. You know the famous saying, you are what you eat? It is absolutely true. The Prophet ﷺ, he draws a picture of a person who's traveling. His clothes are all dirty. His hair is disheveled. And he's in abject poverty. And he needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He gets off his conveyance. He lifts his hands and he says, Oh Allah, I need your help. Oh Allah, I need your help. The Prophet ﷺ says, مَطْعَمُهُ haram." وَمَشْرَبُهُ haram, وَمَلْبَسُهُ haram. أَيْنْ أَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ له. This person, his food that he's taking is haram. His drinking is haram. His clothing are haram. Everything that he earns is from a haram livelihood. So what does the Prophet ﷺ say? أَنَّا يُسْتَجَابُ له. How does he expect for his du'as to be accepted? It's so common that we complain that our children aren't listening to us. Why are they so rebellious? It's very simple, you are what you eat. If we are not cautious of the food that we give our children, of the food that we eat ourselves, whether it's halal, whether it's haram, and we have absolutely no cognizance of this, we will see the effect directly in their habits. We will see the effect directly in their characteristics. This is something of utmost importance. That in certain ahadith, we come to learn that when a person consumes one morsel of haram, if he drinks alcohol, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not accept his ibadat. It will not merit any reward for 40 days. So we may be struggling our best to give our children the perfect Islamic teaching, the perfect Islamic upbringing. We send them to Islamic school. We send them to Sunday school. We send them to madrasa. Yet we don't see that effect. Perhaps there is a caveat. Perhaps there is a leak. And that is the food that we're giving them to eat. Now, I am no si child psychologist, and perhaps many of you may be thinking that, who are you to give me advice on bringing up a child? But I'll tell you one experience that I do have. I grew up as a child, and I know that certain things that my parents taught me as I grew up that were effective, I would like to share that with others. And certain things perhaps I thought to myself were not done adequately, I would also tell those to others. Scholars say that you should ensure three things Three things for, insha'Allah, an ideal Islamic upbringing. Number one, be open with your children. This is very important, that your children should not fear you. They should not feel that they have a burden on their heart and they don't feel comfortable to speak to you. And it's very common right now. There was a study done by Yaqeen Institute, a very beautiful study, where they interviewed several Muslims who were doubting their faith about 30 somewhat Muslims, youngsters who were doubting their faith between the ages of 18 to 30, if I'm not mistaken. And one of the questions that they were asking was, what made you feel like you wanted to leave Islam or what made you doubt Islam? And they said, one of the most compelling factors was when I'm at home, my parents make it so difficult for me to act upon Islam. It's that I get confused, is this Islam or is this culture? Why am I forced to do something where they're blurring the lines? It's not really Islam to begin with. And the scholar who's writing this, he says, it's, unfortunate, it's an unfortunate reality that our children are living a schizophrenic lifestyle. That when they go to school, they feel they're under attack. That I am not Western enough. I am very traditional. And then when they go at home, they're bombarded for being too Western and not traditional enough. So they have this schizophrenia that they feel that, you know what, I have one personality here and I have another personality over there. It's very difficult to curtail this. So as parents, as elder siblings, it's our responsibility to assist them in this challenge, in this difficulty. The Prophet ﷺ was so open with his children. Once Fatima radiallahu anha was walking, he goes to her, he embraces her and he kisses her. And a Bedouin was passing by and he made a remark saying that how could you kiss your children? That's very awkward. We Bedouins don't kiss our children. The Prophet ﷺ said, what do you expect me to do if mercy has been taken away from your heart? The Prophet ﷺ was so open with his children. Once Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she needed something. So what did she do? She came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, listen, I have so many tasks, so I need an assistant in my house. The Prophet ﷺ was open for this conversation. So number one, 
Ensure that you have an open conversation with your children. If they need anything, they should feel comfortable to come and speak to you. Number two, ta'aleem at the house. We need to read a hadith at home. Before we go to sleep, let's pick up a book of hadith like Riyadhul Salihin, or Muntakhab Ahadith, or any book you feel comfortable with and have a sitting. One day your child would read this hadith. The next day you'll read a hadith. And in 10 minutes, the whole conversation can come to an end. But they will learn so many things on a constant basis. Personally, this is one of the most effective methods I saw my parents do. That every single night before we went to sleep, we would read a book of hadith and we would take turns as family members. And this had a big effect that no matter how large the books of hadith I read later on, most of the hadith I remember till this day are those hadith that I read from Fazal Amal as I was a young so read the alim at home. It's very important. Number three, and very important, we should open the doors for our children to get Islamic education. Whether it's Islamic school, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's after school maktab, whether it's just a muallim coming to your house. The effects that a Muslim teacher can have on a child is amazing. You'll be surprised that a child grows up with his teacher for 10 years of his adolescence and he learns so many Islamic etiquettes from him. And this is something which is part of our history. That scholars, and I can stand here all day and recount incidents of scholars who traveled thousands of miles just to acquire knowledge. In the process, they remained hungry, they gave off their homes, they even sold the clothes on their body. But what's more fascinating is they even undertook journeys of this nature just to learn the etiquettes from their teachers. Abdullah ibn Mubarak was once asked that where are you traveling to? He was in a place known as Maru and he traveled all the way to Basra, thousands of kilometers. And a person asked him, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Ibn Aun. So the person asked him why you're going to him. He says, so I can learn his manners and I can learn etiquettes from him. Hafiz al-Dhahabi, he says that Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah ta'ala, he used to have a majlis, a session of hadith, and 5,000 people would be present there. From the 5,000, only 500 came to learn hadith and write hadith. 4,500 and more came only to see his manners and inculcate the etiquettes that he has. So this is something that we should take on board, that our children should be afforded the opportunity to be exposed to is Muslim scholars, Islamic programs, Islamic school, just so they can have that upbringing under the vision of a trained scholar. It's very beneficial. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inculcate Islamic etiquettes into our lives. And scholars mention we can do three things which will help us to better nurture our children according to Islamic etiquette. Number one, be open with them. If they ever feel uncomfortable, don't exacerbate the issue by screaming at them, yelling at them, and telling them how wrong they are. Rather realize the difficulty of the times and open up to them and give them a, lending, give them a shoulder to lean on. Number two, have ta'aleem at home. Try to read books of hadith. No matter what book you feel comfortable with, before you go to sleep, many of us read bedtime stories to our children. Why not also read stories of the sahaba before they sleep and it could inculcate within them certain ethos of Islam. Number three, and very important, try to open up programs for them. Take them to a weekly masjid halaqa. Take them to an Islamic school. Make the, introduce them to scholars just so that they can learn not only education, but even the tarbiyah of that scholar, even the nurturing of that scholar. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all the ability to practice upon what has been said. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Nice khutbah. We, we have every Friday and Saturday and Sunday classes in this masjid also. So you can bring your kids here. Jazakallah khair. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله 
أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة فيما هم في وجوههم من أثر السجود 
ذلك مثلهم في التوراة ومثلهم في الإنجيل كزر إن أخرج شطعه فآزره فاستغلظ فاستوى على سوقه يعجب الزراع ليغيظ بهم الكفار وعد الله الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات منهم مغفرة وأجرا عظيما وقال عليه الصلاة والتسليم الله الله في أصحابي لا تتخذوهم غرضا من بعدي فمن أحبهم فبحبي أحبهم ومن أبغضهم فببغضي أبغضهم وقال وخير الناس قرني ثم الذين يلونهم ثم الذين يلونهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم ثبتنا على الإيمان وأمتنا على الإيمان واحشرنا يوم القيامة مع المتقين مع الإيمان اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم انصر الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم إنا نسألك موجبات رحمتك وعزائم مغفرتك والغنيمة من كل بر والسلامة من كل إثم اللهم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة هي لك رضا إلا قضيتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه قال الله تبارك وتعالى فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون يا معشر المسلمين قوموا إلى الصلاة وسووا صفوفكم <تصفيق>